there, I'm Joey from EDH Rec, and today I don't want to talk about exciting cards. I don't want to talk about bombastic commander powerhouses. Today I want to talk about lackluster cards, and why you should probably play more of them. Let's say you're building an artifact deck. You know, you love artifacts, and you cannot wait to get a bunch of awesome artifact payoffs in the list, so you're getting all those good cards in there. Creatures that draw cards whenever you cast artifacts, enchantments that make tokens or have enormous effects whenever you cast these pieces of metal, planeswalkers and amazing spells with huge effects equal to the number of artifacts you've accumulated. Look how cool these effects are, how could you pass them up? You can't wait to get all these rewards in-game. Except, hold up, none of these payoffs are artifacts themselves. And since you also need to play a bunch of other staple categories in the list, like card advantage spells or removal effects, you suddenly realize there's only room left for like five artifact cards in the deck. This is a pretty common problem that I've seen nearly every first time artifact player encounter. The payoffs are so entrancing and so numerous that they overwhelm the deck, and suddenly there's no room for any actual artifact cards that would trigger any of those payoffs. Despite playing tons of fantastic, expensive, splashy cards, the deck actually suffers greatly because it has a low density of the thing that really matters, artifact cards. And yeah, there are a lot of very cool artifacts out there. Mere Battlesphere, for instance, is totally rad, a classic of the genre. But a lot of the coolest cards like that occupy some pretty high spots on the mana curve, so they don't often emerge until later in the game. And what the deck actually needs are some artifacts that will grease the wheels on earlier turns. But when you start looking at those possible lower cast artifacts to play, not all of them look quite so exciting. And that's how we got into this mess in the first place, right? The most exciting cards were those splashy payoffs, and by comparison, the actual artifacts look a lot less powerful. But you still need them. Here's another example, one I recently went through with my Sir Conrad the Grim deck. I've tinkered with and retooled this deck probably like every three or four months since I first built it. It's a hard one to pin down. And Conrad himself is such an obnoxious card, one that broadcasts its strategy so loudly that it draws a lot of attention to itself, and therefore people don't usually let me get away with the shenanigans I'm threatening to do when I show up with this commander in my command zone. I've tackled this commander in a couple of different ways. I've tried fashioning this deck to prioritize mill, and it didn't quite fit for me. I've tried prioritizing big mana production, and that was okay, but still a little wobbly. And then I changed it to be a little bit more classic aristocracy, and that felt better. That felt like the strategy I was truly after, the thing I'd always wanted to enjoy about this deck. But still, something was off, and it often looked like this. I'd wind up with, say, a Viscera Seer, a Grim Horror Specs, and a Zulaport Cutthroat in play, and I'd think, heck yeah, I have my Aristocrats cards all lined up. But what am I actually going to sacrifice? I didn't want to eat the Horror Specs, that's the card draw payoff. I didn't want to eat the Zulaport, that's the life drain payoff. And I didn't want to sacrifice the Viscera Seer to itself because I need it to enable the other stuff in the first place. And in those moments with that past version of the deck, I'd noticed that I often had some really, really cool spells in my hand. Just absolutely rad enchantments, instants, sorceries, legitimately awesome cards. But if literally any single one of those cards had just been a creature, any creature, then I'd have felt a lot better. Those spells might be cool, but just the presence of a creature card in that card slot would have had massive ripple effects on the rest of the deck. So I did another overhaul on the list, to the version you're seeing now, because the creatures I already had were not able to carry the weight of the strategy all on their own. What I needed was more fodder. I started adding in some creatures that, to be honest, aren't my absolute favorite things in the world. Chittering Witch and Marsh Flitter, these cards are nice I guess, but they're not the kinds of cards I look at and I go, oh, you know what, I gotta play, I gotta get that in there. But holy crap, now that I've got them, the deck plays so much more smoothly now. Those extra little creature cards just add up in all these small ways. With those extra bodies, I draw more cards off of Yawgmoth, or off of Skullclamp, or Harrispex off of my non-token creatures. I drain more life off of a Zulaport Cutthroat or a Blood Artist effect, or off of Conrad's own Death Trigger. 
In fact, more creatures in the deck could deal more damage on the occasion that I mill some cards, or whenever I do a mass reanimation spell if Conrad is in play to see those cards entering or leaving the graveyard. I get more mana off of a Crypt of Agadim when there are more creature cards in my graveyard, or I produce more tokens off of my favorite Tombstone Stairwell, dealing even more damage. I cut a bunch of powerhouse cards from the deck, and I added in Fodder, Chum, Slop, but it made the deck better. And in fact, this is a lesson I've had to learn twice in this deck, because it also cropped up in my mana base. Sure, there are a lot of very cool utility lands you can use in a list like this, but I don't. Because if I want my Cabal lands to be effective, or my Swamp Doublers to work properly, then I need to have some discipline, and I need to play a lot of basic Swamps. Because more often than not, the mere presence of a simple, boring, basic Swamp, again, has a bunch of ripple effects that add up in all of these tiny ways. And those little edges could be the difference that helps eke out a win. Speaking of lands, this is why we've often voiced some concern about landfall decks that play a low land count. The lands themselves are the fodder that you need. Without them, the Bailoths and the Explorations and the Scoot Swarms will miss triggers. I've totally seen landfall decks crack fetches or cast ramp spells and realize, oh shoot, I'm out of basics in the deck, and thus they miss out on some game-winning landfall triggers. Land cards are way less exciting than the landfall payoffs, but having too many payoffs is a little like having too many cooks in the kitchen. After all, you don't often need more than one landfall payoff in play. Just one Scoot Swarm is usually enough to take over a board all on its own, as long as it's properly fed with a steady stream of land cards. Casting too many payoffs can often be a way of overextending, leaving yourself susceptible to get blown out by a board wipe. So playing more fodder instead of more payoffs can also indirectly teach a good lesson about restraint. In my own landfall decks, I've often gone for a minimum of 40 lands, and even if it's heart-wrenching not to play some of those really cool payoff cards, the fact that I have more lands and more basics to search up often makes the payoffs I do play shine even more brightly. And there are so many other ways this type of thing can manifest. Have you ever seen a plus one plus one counter deck that got out a hardened scales, a branching evolution, and a corpse jack menace, but it didn't actually have any way to deploy any dang counters? Even just placing one counter on something would turn into like eight, but you need to play enough cards in your deck that can actually put counters on things. Even if those counter gatherers aren't the most exciting cards in the deck, the density of them is what actually allows the strategy and the payoffs to flourish in the first place. And this actually brings me to another valuable lesson about, quote, lackluster cards their redundancy. If your commander is your usual supplier of counters, for example, the ease of accessing it at any time right there from the command zone can often make it feel like you don't need a bunch of other counter gatherers in your actual deck. But having a few more counter gatherers, even some that look a little underwhelming, can take a lot of pressure off your commander so it doesn't have to do all the heavy lifting. Even if the cards don't look exciting at first, even if they're clunky or they're not your favorite, they play an important role as a pressure valve that lets your commander off the hook so that your entire deck doesn't become too commander centric and your opponents can't just shut you down by simply removing one card on your battlefield. Finally, one of the most important things about these fodder cards isn't just how they appear to you, but how they appear to your opponents too. A Mina and Den in the command zone, for instance, doesn't create nearly the same amount of terror as an Omnath in the command zone. In fact, I'd actually like to shout out the Legendary Creature podcast here, who have a very long episode on this topic called Remove Or, in which they discuss the idea of, quote, functionally hexproof cards. Cards that can give you some value, but they don't strike your opponents as the type of thing that they want to spend an entire removal spell on, so the card basically never gets targeted. Opponents will much rather save a removal spell for an actual crisis, a must-answer threat, like when someone deploys a doubling season, who wants to spend their removal spell on your Jadar when there's a Consecrated Sphinx looming over the field. To paraphrase some of their examples, a Jory N in the command zone definitely doesn't draw the same type of attention as the Tatiovas or Muldrothas of the world. A card that appears underwhelming to you can actually be leveraged in gameplay, because it will drop lower on opponents' priority lists as well, and hopefully that can help you elide a bit of removal. Definitely go check out the Legendary Creature podcast. They do deep dives and get very contemplative about these types of topics. Highly recommend.
I'll admit, this last lesson, playing cards that also don't look good to your opponents, is still one that I'm struggling with. I like the big bombastic cards a lot. Those are the types of things that excite me. I just also know the target that they paint on themselves, or the target that they paint on me. So as I continue in my commander playing career, this is something that I hope to tinker with just a little bit more, to find ways of hiding in plain sight while still being capable of having a bigger impact on the game later on. Finding that balance is a really good thing to strive for. I think that's the through line on all of these aspects to these cards that, at first, may appear to be a little underwhelming or lackluster. Some of them may help you fly under the radar. Some will help you not to overextend or to take heat off of your commander. Some will help you recognize when you've got more payoffs than enablers and the deck needs a little more actual fuel to make the best payoffs truly pop off. They might not be the most exciting cards in the world, but they're workhorses. They're the things that actually grease the wheels. They're fodder, they're filler, they're underwhelming. But that also means they're some of the most overwhelmingly important cards in your deck. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this topic. Leave them down in the comments below. Do the whole like and subscribe rigmarole. How do you manage to strike this delicate balance in your own commander decks? Thanks so much for watching. And as always, remember, EDH wreck your deck before you wreck your deck. Thank you.